Hey, good afternoon to you. It is now 406 News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we're making sense of the news. Coming up on the program, Julio Rosas will join us. We'll talk to him about what he's seeing on the ground as rescue efforts continue in the wake of Hurricane Helene. You can join us at 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. Two years ago, we got a call from a gentleman named Thomas, a Loudoun County Schools employee whose daughter was at the time a part of Loudoun County Schools. And he said that uh, something awful was going on within the school system. So he he pulled his daughter out. Uh, listen, this is the call again two years ago. Take a listen. You know, I, uh, you know, I was actually kind of nervous calling in because, uh, you know, teachers are afraid to speak out about it. Um, I, I have a kind of a personal experience. My wife and I just put my daughter in private school because... Um, for the past previous school year for about the last four or five months without us knowing uh, they were kind of affirming her uh, and uh, she's kind of going through some gender um, questioning. Um, they were calling her by a different name. We didn't know this until almost the last day of school. And so our answer was to basically take her out. So I'm a teacher in Loudoun County and I can't even keep my daughter in the school system anymore. So. So Thomas pulled his daughter out of the school system. You hear him say there that the school was literally deceiving him about uh, what was going on with his daughter, which is disgraceful. Um, I, uh, I, have, I have some good news for you. I met Thomas this morning. Thomas and I, I got a chance to meet each other in person. We were out there in Loudoun County uh, at, in Leesburg at the Office of Elections there. So many great Americans gathering together to cast their ballots today in early voting in the Commonwealth. Uh, and Thomas stepped up and said, hey, I called you two years ago, and uh, I have an update for you on this story. So I thought it'd be, it would be nice if Thomas could share it with all of us. Thomas joins us now on the phone. Hello, Thomas. Good to have you back on the show, sir. Hey, Vince. It's great to, uh, great to be here. Thanks uh, for inviting me. It's great to meet you this morning, you and Corey. Um, great to see you out there. Thanks for coming out to Loudoun. It was, it was a great event. Uh, so many great people, and uh, including yourself. And uh, uh, Thomas, you know, this is I I when I listen to this audio, I remember this call and thinking, man, this is what a rough situation this gentleman is in uh, that uh, you're being deceived by the very school system that you work for about the status of your daughter. And there are people within the school system, apparently, who, who are filling your daughter's head with all sorts of lies about herself. Give us uh, a sense of of where the journey went from there. What happened? Yeah, it was, um, <clears throat> as I told you at the time, you know, it was, a, it was a shock to my wife and I when we found this out. And it was, it was almost the end of school um, when we did find out. It was, it was almost by accident that we found out. And, uh, you know, we, we really felt kind of betrayed because, you know, as parents, you know, obviously we feel that we have, you know, the first say in, in what's happening in our daughter's life. And um, just to kind of find it out, you know, almost accidentally that this was going on and that, they were kind of supporting her in that. That was a real shock to the system, a, a kind of a betrayal, like I said. And, um, but as you said, you know, there's there's good news in the story. Um, we decided at that point, um, through the help of some uh, some dear friends in our church, um, we were able to kind of put her into a private school. Um, and uh, it's interesting, you know, the, the very first day of that school, this was two years ago, um, you know, she really didn't want to go. She was upset about it. And, and my wife and I told her, look, just go into it with an open mind. You don't have to love it. We're not asking you to love it, but uh, please don't go into it, you know, thinking you're going to hate it. Just give it a chance. And at the end of that very first day, when I picked her up, uh, I hadn't seen her smile in a long time, but she was smiling. She was laughing. She'd made a, a good friend group, which I think is a big part of the story. Um, and uh, since then, over the past two years, um, she's come to realize, you know, that she wasn't actually, you know, a boy. She wasn't uh, a transgender person. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's really worked out in a positive way. And I, I think a big, a big part of that is just the fact that, you know, my wife and I didn't accept the narrative that, that we were being told, um, about how, you know, um, gender dysphoria works or how, you know, a person her age at the time, she was only 13, um, can make those sort of decisions for herself. You know, you, you get a lot of information from schools, you get a lot of information from, uh, you know, just people um, who tell you that, you know, if you kind of fight against this or, 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 you know, try to speak against this, that, you know, you're going to put your child at risk, they're at yes. more risk for suicide, things like that. And that's, that's just not true in this case, for sure. 
It's unbelievable. So you said that um, you're, you had friends from church who helped. Uh, does that mean that you put her in a Christian school? Is that when you say private school? Yeah, it was, it was a Christian private school. Um, she's still there now. Um, and, you know, the, the, the one of the things I said was a big part of the story. I think when she was at the, the Loudoun County School, of course, you know, the, the teachers, and I'm, I'm a teacher in Loudoun County, you know, there's a sort of like a idea that we're, we're not allowed to kind of speak out against these things. And so when the student sort of says, hey, I'm now a boy or I'm now a girl and they want to change their names, you know, we're supposed to kind of support that. And at, at the time, especially, we weren't supposed to mention anything to the parents. And so, you know, this, this sort of happens uh, with adults that they trust. Um, and so, you know, in their lives, when yeah. they're getting sort of this information from adults. And then, of course, when they have a friend group that's sort of supporting this because it's, it's uh, the normal thing to do, so to speak. Um, it's, it's really sort of become a social contagion, so, which, which in her case, I think is what it was. You know, there's, there's obviously people that suffer from gender dysphoria and, and I, you know, I think those people need compassion and respect and, you know, uh, obviously medical, you know, advice and things like that. Um, yeah. But, uh, but, you know, when you just have young girls, especially who are being sort of told these lies about themselves, you know, they're, they're impressionable. They're going to believe it. And, um, you know, there's a lot of harm that comes from that. And fortunately, yeah. not not in the case of my daughter. But. Right. Yeah. The last thing you want to do with someone is enable their destruction. You want to rescue them right. from that, obviously. And so um, you said it was the friend group. I assume typically with with girls, it's like their friends are almost all girls, maybe with some exceptions. Uh, and and yeah. you're making me think about um, there was a book that written by Abigail Schreier called Irreversible Damage. And she she wrote uh, quite a bit about this, that especially among young women, that it's a social contagion, that it, that'll, that an entire group of girls will all begin saying that actually we're boys uh, in unison, uh, at suggesting, of course, that this is just a, a matter of, of, of social decision making. Uh, was that what you found? Yeah, and it's actually it's interesting that you mentioned that book. You know, when this, this happened, of course, I decided to try to you know, educate myself quite a bit to kind of figure out what was going on. And that was one of the books I read. Um, and, you know, that it, what, what um, the author said in that book, um, I could see, of course, in my own daughter's life, you know, kind of looking at it from that perspective. And then, of course, you know, thinking about my own teaching experiences, uh, same thing, you know, um, you know, it seems to be a large population of, of younger girls that sort of um, kind of buy into this, um, you know, their friend groups will sort of do that. Um, it becomes almost popular or cool to kind of be that way. Um, and again, I'm not saying that's in every case. I mean, there, are, as I said, there are, you know, real cases of people who have, you know, a, a mental, um, you know, condition, gender dysphoria. Yes, yes they um, have which, confusion which, uh, about their own gender, right. but but they shouldn't yeah, be led astray but, into thinking that they're a mistake. This this is what I sure. preach all the time. It's like your your body is not a mistake. Your body's not a mistake. Right. Don't let anybody convince you of that. Yeah, and that's that's what we've been working with my daughter on. And as I said, over those past two years, you know, after that first year of being at the school. Um, she had basically developed a new friend group that, you know, basically were friends with her because of who she was and not yes. because of like, you know, just how the, they could the, use her social fad. Yeah. yeah. And same thing with the teachers, you know, I mean, and, and you know, it's interesting because at, at the school she's at now, I mean, these aren't issues that are even really promoted or talked about. It's not like it's part of an agenda or something like that. So I think being out of an environment where that was sort of like in her face all the time yeah, um, really helped. And, you know, we, as I said, we, we didn't try to convince her that she was going to like the school or anything like that, but she, she really did like it. And it's decided she's been there as her, the start of her third year there. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to say, you know, she's, she's not thinking that she's a boy anymore. She's not thinking, you know, that she wants to be part of that transgender movement. She's, uh, you know, uh, basically behaving like you would think a normal Sure. 16 year old or almost 16 year old girl. Would so, be, so what does she think of that era of her life now looking back on it? How does she, how does she assess it? Yeah. You know, it's an interesting question and, and, you know, it's, it's still a little close to the, the time when that was happening. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, my wife and I still kind of approach it, you know, carefully. Um, but I think she looks back on that with a, you know, a sense of, you know, sympathy maybe to people that are going through these things. Um, you know, she's got a big heart for people. Um, and so, you know, I think she, she looks at that time as, you know, I think she's glad she's out of it, um, out of that situation. You know, we've asked her if she wanted to go back to, you know, a different school, but, a, you know, a public school, she doesn't want to do that. Um, and I, I think she can feel, you know, a lot of 
sort of concern for people that are going through the same thing as, yeah. as her that she went through. So can I, um, I, 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 by the way, I'm so grateful, Thomas, that you're sharing all this because I think it's instructive. And I, and I know that one of the reasons you are sharing it is kind of as a, a way to, to give um, other parents out there some sense of hope about how to navigate yeah, these definitely. issues. Yeah. Uh, one, one question I have, and it may be a bit personal, but I don't, I don't know if this is your daughter's situation, but um, one of the other things that we often see with uh, girls who are convinced of this, that they're boys, it's not just a matter of social contagion. There's also high degrees of correlations of autism that young mm -hmm. uh, Chloe Cole, for instance, as she's told us, uh, she's she's very famously gone through all of this and had a lot of regret about the way that she was exploited and treated. Uh, and she's talked about, you know, she has autism and that that was taken advantage of. Uh, did you detect that with, say, your daughter's friend group at all? Was was that something that you noticed? Um, you know, not necessarily. Um, I think my daughter's friend group was more um, sort of like trying to find a place for themselves. They didn't really fit into the, you know, the popular you know what you would might call the pretty girl group they sure. weren't super nerdy necessarily you know they you know they were trying to find their own way and so i think i think that was more of the case though I, though I will say you know my daughter she she doesn't have autism or anything like that but you know she does have some executive functioning sort of things that we're, we've been dealing with and right. um you know she's just uh you know she's <laughs> she's doing great in school and everything like that but yeah she yeah. doesn't she doesn't, doesn't have autism but I, I think for her group it was more just uh you know, trying to find who they wanted to be, you know, like yeah. most teenagers do, you know, they're trying to fit in. Right. And for whatever reason, you know, that was sort of what seemed like the the fit at the time. Yeah. And, um, and kids, your kids really are decent much. and those, that decency can be exploited and they're impressionable. Yeah. It's, this is, I mean, it's a really wild time and, uh, and, and so many people are led astray in so many directions uh, yeah. through, throughout the generations. This is one of the latest iterations of that as a teacher in Loudoun County schools. It must drive you crazy that the school system encourages this kind of deceit with the parents. Uh, how, how has yeah. it changed your view of all of that? You know, it's, um, you know, and I got to be a little bit careful, I guess, what I say. I don't want to, you know, I, I still need my job. But, um, I respect you that. Know, it, 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 it is very frustrating, um, you know, because not only am I a teacher, and I, of course, I'm a father who's sort of seen this, but I'm, I'm also a, a Christian and a believer and, um so, you know, when I have a student that is, you know, going through something like this, of course, you know, my first thought is that I have concern for this person. You know, I, I want them to live a happy, healthy life. And, you know, it's, you know, I, I want, obviously, I'm hoping that their parents are involved with these sort of things. And um, just to sort of be stymied in that um, and not even be able to offer, like, my perspective. But, you know, the idea is that I kind of have to give the, the party line, so to speak. Yeah. Um, it, it's very, very frustrating. Um you know, I, I question a lot, you know, am I actually, you know, being a teacher in some ways doing a disservice to students in these situations? Um, you know, it's, I think, I think all these things really need to happen in the home. I don't necessarily think it's a teacher's or a school's place to be teaching, you know, uh, sexuality, sexuality and ethics to, to, to a large degree. I mean, I think it needs to start at home. Um, but, you know, and of course, it, it seems like in our school system, that's what they're trying to like not let you do. They want to take care of it at the school, and I, I just think that's uh, yeah, that's the wrong wrong way well, to go. And, it, and as you said, it is frustrating. So. And and there are all sorts of things in our in our in our culture in our country where um, you know people who are given positions of responsibility are, have duties to report. You know where they have an obligation to report uh, things that are traumatic or important or abuse uh, in order to exactly. try and rescue yeah. a child. And and this is one of those categories that's been inverted. Uh, when it comes to this issue of of young kids who are convinced that they were born in the wrong bodies, and so what a, what a disgrace that that's that's the case. I will say, Thomas, yeah. uh, you and your wife, um, uh, you know, you stood up for your daughter, you took care of her, and uh, this is that's a that's this is such a great story because um, she's totally irreplaceable, and uh, you, as her father, stood up for her. You did the exact right thing, and thank God you did. And uh, I'm so well, grateful you, you came back to yeah. update us. Yeah, you know, I couldn't have done it without, obviously, my faith, my church, and my friends. Um, you know, it, it was a big decision and, you know, a, kind of a costly decision, too. And But, you know, as you said, you know, I wouldn't change anything. I mean, my daughters uh, and all my children, I have three other children, um, you know, they're, they're definitely worth it and worth that fight. So, yeah, I, I hope uh, other parents are maybe encouraged by this and uh, 
you know, I really appreciate you inviting me to come give an update. So. Thomas, so nice to meet you today and so great to hear this story. I'm, I love how it turned out. God bless you and thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you again in the future, sir. Yeah, I hope so, Vince. God bless you too. All right, let's go to the phones. I've got Hoke calling in from Round Hill right now, line one. Hello, Hoke, you're on the Vince Colony Show. Hey, Vince. I uh, figured, found out something interesting today. Are you familiar with the uh, transgender volleyball player out at San Jose State? Yeah, the uh, there's a female – well, no, there's a male volley player <laughs> playing for San Jose State, and all of the teams that keep going against San Jose State, the women's teams, are now forfeiting their matches because they refuse to play against a dude. Well, one team actually did play a recent match, and they actually beat San Jose State. But did you know, at least – let me rephrase that. I found out today that um, – that player actually graduated from a Loudoun County or played volleyball at a Loudoun County high school. Yeah. John champ high school. Uh, yep. and, and the, the videos of this guy playing against these girls is un, are unbelievable. The guy is like, he's going up. There's highlight videos. You can see, uh, from 2018 he, going up in the air, just like slamming these spikes down onto these girls who have no chance of catching up. And a women's net is about six inches lower than a men's net um, in volleyball. Is that so? I didn't realize that. But well, there you go. So all the more advantage. Uh, and uh, so, and that's what Loudoun County's producing, huh, Hoke? That, you know, I was surprised. I don't know why I found that out. It came up, and I don't even know why. It came up in some conversation today, and I was actually shocked by it. I did not know it. Yeah, the uh, the a lot of the some of the parents in Loudoun County have been sharing uh, a lot of this, uh, and uh, wanted trying to get the word out uh, that that's the case, and it, that just keeps happening. You keep having um, boys playing on girls' sports teams, in particular in Loudoun County. I don't know what it is about Loudoun County, but they are obsessed with doing this, uh, and then oftentimes trying to keep it from the parents. I mean, how often do you think they notify the other girls' sports teams that they're about to play against a boy? I would bet never, but I will say this about Loudoun County, and I've lived here since 1998. I swear the county code in this place should be 666. Yeah, the, oh, the area code, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> things are really going downhill. That's a, that's a, that's usually the number we use to represent that. So when you're right at the very bottom of the pit. Uh, thank you, Hoke. Yeah. You imagine. It reminds me, you know, remember Meet the Parents when Ben Stiller went absolutely ballistic during the volleyball game? He goes up for a spike and smashes it into a girl's face. And everyone's like, what are you doing, Greg? They used his last name in the movie. I'm not sure if it's FCC compliant, so I won't use it now. But uh, that's what's happening. Thanks, Loudon. Way to go. Coming up, Julio Rosas will be with us at the top of the hour. We're going to talk about what he's seeing amongst... The wreckage of Hurricane Helene. Is FEMA doing anything? We'll ask him. Hey, good afternoon to you. It is now 435 News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we're making sense of the news. Coming up 5 o'clock, Julio Rosas will be with us, national correspondent for The Blaze, a man who always goes to some of the toughest scenes across the country as the chaos breaks out. Uh, he's surveying the damage from Hurricane Helene as the rescue efforts continue. He'll give us a sense of what's happening there. And you can join us at 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. You see these reports that uh, the obesity level in the United States is starting to go down. They say obesity is is going down. It's It's the first time in like forever. The obesity rate in the United States has stopped climbing. One of my first reactions was, well, yeah, because nobody can afford food anymore. That's what, Maybe that's what's happening. They, uh, they actually say that there's some belief that it's ozempic, that so many Americans are taking drugs to lose weight now. Ozempic is all the rage at the moment. And uh, maybe that's dropping some of the obesity levels. Uh, but they say that... Um, that severe obesity, meanwhile, is rising. Severe obesity. I had to look it up. What is severe obesity? That's when you are over 100 pounds overweight. And that's 10% of the country. 10% of U.S. adults, according to CDC data, are severely obese. One out of every 10. 
I'm so glad that uh, President Trump has brought RFK Jr. into this campaign and uh, is taking advice from people like Callie and Casey Means. And uh, this this make America healthy again thing that they're doing is so worthwhile. It is so completely worthwhile because think of all the ways that we need to improve as a country and get back on track. One of them is to once again, have whole families, fathers, mothers, children. We should be having more children. We should be taking care of Americans. We need Americans to be more spiritually put together. But one of the ways that you are in a better position, and one of the most obvious ways, is if you're just in shape, if you're healthy, if you're if you're eating healthy, if your body's in good shape, if if you feel good, you're not going through wild swings, maybe doing a little bit of working out, getting that heart pumping, just making Americans stronger again. It used to be that was something we valued. And our government has just shot everybody in the direction of, oh, no, 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 the pharmaceutical industry will will rescue you. We just need a thousand more Ozempics. Whatever your issue is, we'll put a jab in your body and we'll fix it. That's not working out. That's not working out at all. A lot of misery in that direction. And by the way, one of the reasons for that is the FDA is totally corrupt uh, and has all these awful inside deals, and it has not served the country well. The opioid crisis started in earnest because of all of the FDA's corruption. Enough, enough. We don't need you know a food pyramid that recommends that you kill yourself when you consume food. That's idiotic. So a lot has to change. The Make America Healthy Again track is super important. It may even bring in some voters who don't normally think to themselves, hey, I should vote for the Republican candidate in this contest. Maybe you should, actually, because the Democrats are doing nothing but making it worse. They're in bed with these pharmaceutical companies. They're they're a a part of, they're very a part of a captured crony uh, environment. So yes, we do get some data today that says, oh, well, obesity is slightly ticking down, but severe obesity is going up. What does that tell you? And we can't medicate our way out of every problem. And one other piece here, there's a financial implication here that everyone needs to be cognizant of. If America is healthier, that means we spend a lot less money, all of us, on rescuing unhealthy Americans. How many stupid debates do they have in Washington every year about, are we going to spend more money on this health program? Are we going to cut money from this health program? How are we going to get past uh, all of this massive debt that we have? We have to address entitlements. You hear stuff like this, and, and very few people actually say, why don't we attack the underlying problem, which is that if Americans were a lot healthier, we wouldn't have to spend all this money on sustaining them through their chronic illness. What are we doing? This is why I just had Marty McCary on this past week. If you missed that conversation, please, please, please check out the podcast, the Vince Colony Show podcast. I encourage you to subscribe to that too. By the way, that's a, 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 a podcast subscription is the sound of applause that we can detect back at the radio station. Oh, people like it. They're subscribing. And the content is good. This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to produce good content for you. And uh, Dr. Marty McCary came on this past week and was saying that, uh, first of all, addressing the food supply and making Americans healthier again should be right there at the top of the list. And he also dug deep into the way that medical professionals uh, are trained and are doing their jobs in our country. Lots of good doctors out there, but the medical industry involves increasing specialization where you have all of these doctors who are concentrated strictly on their specialization and are focused only on disease maintenance or it dealing with that that area of your life that they're that they're so specially trained to deal with and it's amazing what they know but the medical industry is not holistic in the way it handles the human body we hear from doctors they say the the education on nutrition is virtually non-existent in medical school very little time is spent on nutrition and so what we need to get back to is a world in which uh the medical industry thinks about people holistically It doesn't just push them towards the thing that's going to enrich the pharmaceutical companies. When a disease from China, when COVID pops up and it turns out that obesity is the signature thing that tells you whether or not you're going to have a good or a bad outcome, well, you should be telling people to lose the weight, eat healthier, get outside, go for a run. And that's not what they said. Instead, they wanted to enrich Pfizer. That's what they did. 
And so Americans are done with that game. They should be. The ones who are waking up to all of this. And so if, uh, if RFK provides anything, it'll be uh, an improved conversation around that issue. And we can get back to some of the stuff like, you know, JFK, those hilarious uh, clips of JFK talking about uh, like how awful it is to see overweight children. Do you remember those? Like the JFK once warned America about soft, chubby looking, uh, so, soft, chubby, fat looking children, uh, which is one of the greatest things. I'm looking up the clip right now for you because uh, oh, here it is. Yeah, this is JFK saying there's nothing more unfortunate than fat kids. Take a listen to this. There is nothing, uh, I think, uh, more unfortunate than to have uh, soft, chubby, fat looking children who go to uh, watch uh, their school play basketball every Saturday and regard that as their week's exercise. I hope that all of you will join and everybody in the United States to make sure that our children participate fully in a vigorous and adventurous life which is possible for them in this very rich country of ours. That, isn't that great? <laughs> Bring that back. Uh, so RFK Jr., a, a relative of JFK, uh, looking to bring that back. Looking to bring that back. Uh, all right, let's see. Uh, lots of calls coming in, so let's take some. I got Mark calling in from Landover Hills, Line 3. Hello, Mark. You're on the Vince Colonnais Show. Top of the day to you, Vince. Great show again with the information you share with us, buddy. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Mark. Hey, Vince, I wanted to say something, and you and I have talked about this before, and it's good that you bring this up and we can tie things together here. Because you were 100% correct about your, what you're saying with the FDA, and I'll even throw in the World Health Organization, with their ideas of what suitable nutrition are for adults and children. Because they do not have their system set up for us to thrive. They have it set up to barely keep us from getting scurvy. And also, Vince, <laughs> we must remember that they are lying through their teeth about telling people about us living in a – the inner-city kids and inner-city people are the only ones that are living in a food desert. I've got news for them, Vince. With their frozen food world and their garbage that they push on people, even people on low income, that they are only fooling themselves. And one thing else, Vince, I'll get off here because you said you had a lot of calls coming in. As far as uh, J RFK goes and JFK – Vince, when is the last time we heard, and you remember this, Vince, I know you do, because you work out, that, man, one of the biggest things the president talked about was his fitness, or his fit, physical fitness council. Who's the head of it? You won't hear Magoo and his gang say one word about that, because they are building an obese world. Yeah, and obesity is dependency. And and, uh, and and instead of self determination, uh, and so yeah, it's it's the kind of thing you've got to tackle. And and you you mentioned just now this phrase food deserts, which the left has bandied about for years, and and they were yep. bandying it about because they were claiming uh, that uh, the only reason uh, anyone's unhealthy is because they don't act, have access to fresh fruit and fresh vegetables. That was the claim. Uh, there's a there's a fellow called John McWhorter. He's a, a linguist who, uh, who writes occasionally for the New York Times, but he wrote. Uh, a little about almost, uh, let's see, almost two decades ago, practically. Well, 2010. He wrote in 2010 about something called the myth of the food desert. And he actually went and he found that almost every American actually lives within range of healthy food. Uh, and yeah. that this is a lie that the left has been spreading. Uh, and yeah. but, but now, even since then, in the past 14 years, we've, we've learned a lot about our food and, and, uh, and the perils of it and how to make it more healthy. Unfortunately, the government is standing in the way of that. Yes, they are, Vince, through their bribery. And if you notice, Archer Daniel Midlands and all those people that push their high fructose corn syrup and their sugar world since the 60s are still doing it, and people in Congress are profiting from it, Vince. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's exactly why the, the game keeps going the way it does. It's rigged. Thank you, thank you, Mark. I appreciate the call. Really smart. Thank you, sir. Hey, buddy. Take care. That's, uh, that's, that's Mark. Uh, Larry's calling in from Springfield on line seven. Larry, you are on the Vince Colonna show. Oh, this is, uh, this is Arnold. Uh, he had to take a bio break. Uh, wait, I wait. Talk to you about Larry, Larry, to uh, Larry took a bio break. You said, and now we're, now we have Arnold. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. I want to talk to you about the president's council on fitness, fitness back in the eighties <laughs> with Ronald Reagan. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm back. Uh, yeah, when I was uh, in the Army, we actually 
were really impressed with the fact that um, Arnold Schwarzenegger was and somebody by the name of York, uh, an athlete by the name of York, York Onan, I think his name was. Okay. And he was the president's council on physical fitness. And they had this great program where people could sign into it and they get an award. They would get a patch for being physically fit and keeping a record of it. Whatever happened to that? Let's get Bobby going on that. Yeah, that's, you think that, know, that's you worthwhile. It, it used to be in school that kids office. would have to do the presidential fitness test, right? You'd have to, you'd have to like, yeah, yeah. reach out and touch okay. your toes or okay. leap a certain distance. You know, you have to complete all sorts of physical challenges. Yeah, Arnold can't run for office, but he could be on the cabinet and be the presidential, you know, guru and bring in LeBron and all these other people. Arnold, so, you uh, said like I Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, man, he, he's he can't run for president, but he can certainly be on the president's council again. Didn't he lose his mind though? At didn't his age, I, I, at his age? Yeah. It shows what uh, good fitness can do for you. I want to leave it open for everybody else. Mark. Okay, thank you, thank you. So, so that was Arnold I just spoke with, right? Is that your name, Arnold? Watch out! Watch out! Okay, thank you. I I don't actually know, but that's okay. I appreciate the call. I w I was trying to think. I'm trying to remember all these Hollywood celebrities. Some of them have gone absolutely crazy. I was trying to remember if uh, Schwarzenegger did uh, with uh, Trump. He's like that, that if he if he had um, Trump derangement syndrome or not. So maybe maybe that will or will not work out. But there's lots of really good, talented uh, people who understand fitness who definitely should be a part of a, a Trump administration focus on that issue. That would be that would be really good. Uh, okay, let me see here. Uh, Scott is calling in from Hillsborough on line two with a very important question. Scott, good afternoon, sir. You're on the Vince Colony Show. Hey, Vince. Great to talk to you. I think you missed uh, Larry's joke. He was actually talking about he was pretending to be Arnold. I was wondering if you were trying I must to get have, back yeah. to the morning I, show. Because I, I, when I was at the rally this morning, which okay. I thank you for the donut, even though I am a little overweight, I'm the guy with the really loud truck with the air horn and the boisterous voice towards the end of things. I was wondering, because when we gathered for the picture, I asked you, because I wanted to show my appreciation, because I love the hell out of all of you guys that feed us the truth every day, about showing our appreciation. And Larry said that we were not allowed to give you a hug, that we were all supposed to line up and give you a French kiss. And you said you were going to report him to HR and get mm -hmm. him fired. I'm working on it. Truth? It's I'm working on it right now. It's, uh, I, it's, it's, you know, filling out the complaint form here in this corporate environment. It's actually pretty extensive. Uh, but as soon as I'm oh, done, I'm, go I'm going to try and get Larry O'Connor fired. Yeah, no, actually what happened this morning was I was on the morning show for people who missed it. And I was uh, promoting the fact that we were all out in Loudoun County, that I was hanging out with Scott out there. Uh, and Larry concluded the interview with uh, some ball busting by suggesting that uh, I'm a germaphobe, that, that, that nobody wants to shouldn't nobody should shake hands with me uh, because I'm a total germaphobe and then he went the opposite direction he was feeling his way through the joke and then he started saying stuff about actually you should french kiss him and and go really over the top and so by the time people started arriving everyone was confused about my my interest in space and the way I'd handle and so and, uh, Scott you're not the only one everyone kept coming up to me and they were like is it okay if I shake your hand Larry was saying and uh, I was uh, I was really upset about this. I was annoyed by it because uh, I love Larry, but I didn't like how that interview led all these people to believe that I was a weirdo. Uh, so uh, I'm still navigating it, Scott. <laughs> I knew he was just fun and with you. It was all good. God bless you. God bless you all. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you for being real journalists and actually giving a crap about Finding the truth I, and helping the rest of us learn it, too. I, I know I know, I know. know Larry's just messing with me, and I can't uh, be more happy about the people that I work with. They're, they're great, and, uh, and you're right. They all, they all care. We all care uh, about what's happening to this country, and uh, it's, just, it's just really nice to have a good audience like you, Scott. Thank you very much. Thank you. All day, every day. I'm driving that truck around. I'm hearing you guys from Red Eye Radio in the morning all yeah. throughout the day till I get home, but most of the time listening to... Ben Shapiro. God and bless Scott, you all. and Scott, by the way, weekend. before before I let you go, because you're driving a truck, did you notice how many tr people driving trucks were honking at us this morning to celebrate that we were all out there? 
Oh, yeah, and, and absolutely incredible. I was so tickled to death to pull up and see how many people were out supporting the cause. It was uh, kind of embarrassing for the blue team over there. But, yeah, uh, they were really covering yeah, their faces in shame. Thank you very much for hosting. Yeah, no problem at all. All right, Scott, thank you very much. I want to pick up Connor, who's calling in from Huntsville, Alabama, on line four. Connor, good afternoon, sir. You're on the Vince Gallinay Show. Hey, Vince. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Yes, sir. I think this uh, hurricane response has, has turned this into a, an election about uh, the test of this country's character, not just our governance, but what kind of people are we going to be and what kind of people are we going to be allowed to be? Um, we can't have the heavy hand of government that sits on us and, and keeps us from being the kind and compassionate people that we genuinely are. Yes. The church that I go to doesn't care what race you are. We don't care your political persuasion. If you're hurting, you need help. Yes. And that's the America. I'm 67 years old. And, and despite all of our, our issues in, in the past, that, that is really the, the people that we have always been. Yes. So what's our government going to allow us to be as a people? I've been thinking the same thing. Thank you for that. I, I really appreciate that call, Connor, because it really does come down to who's in charge around here. It's supposed to be the people of this country. The government is not your king. We, we threw that one off. And uh, you have Americans out there trying to rescue their fellow American. And you've got our federal government getting in the way. For more on that, we'll talk to Julio Rosas coming up from The Blaze right after the news. Stay with us.